Hey, this is Leif Ganford. I played the cash register thief in The Amazing Spider-Man, and you're listening to the Everything Geek Podcast. Hey, this is Rich McDonald, and I play Commander David Mason on Call of Duty Black Ops 2. And you're listening to Everything Geek Podcast. Hello, I'm Simon Fisherbecker. You probably know me better as Dorian Moldavar from Doctor Who, or the Fat Friar from Harry Potter. And this is Everything Geek Podcast. Your attention, masters, mistresses. All systems functional for the Everything Geek Podcast. Hey, it's James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Master Poe Cool in Star Wars The Clone Wars, and you're listening to Everything Geek, the podcast. Jackpot with the Everything Geek Podcast. Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Everything Geek Podcast. I'm your host, Rory, and joining me is co host. How do you do? And also joining us today is a very special guest. We have producer Glenn Matsara, who is the creator, showrunner, executive producer, and writer on Damien a showrunner on Seasons 2 and 3, an executive producer and writer on The Walking Dead, an executive producer, co-executive producer, supervising producer, writer, and executive story editor on The Shield, an executive producer, consulting producer, and writer on Clash, an executive producer and writer on Hawthorne, and consulting producer and writer on Criminal Mind, Suspect Behaviour, a story editor and writer on Nash Bridges. Len, how are you? Good. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you join us today on the podcast. So getting right into my first question for you, Glenn, my first question is, how did you decide you wanted to become a producer and writer? You, you know, I always wanted to be a writer. And very lonely by yourself, uh, you know, working on your material. And and I really enjoy collaborating with people. I really enjoy being around other creative voices, and and you know I I always look at the process in a writer's room like a band uh, in a studio or just kind of jamming out songs and trying out different things and and the work coming together with a lot of different people contributing. So when I looked at, you know, how can I marry my two interests, my love of writing, but also, you know, the fact that I I am more of a social person, somebody suggested, well, you should look at TV. And when I was back in New York, I was a hospital administrator. I was a, uh, a manager in an emergency room. So there was a lot of crisis, a lot of activity, very fast paced, um, very high stakes. It was, it was exciting. And I took a lot of those skills, and I think those skills have helped me along as a producer. And so, you know, and once you start down the path, you know, you you hopefully uh, gain experience that qualify you for other opportunities. So uh, the path has kind of opened up in front of me, but I think a lot of it that has been just knowing myself as a person and trying to trust those instincts and seeing, you know, what brings out my best. Yeah, that's really interesting, especially how you started off, you know, trying to focus more on one thing. And then, as you said, in your terms, you know, you married both of your interests, writing and being with people. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think it is about people. You know, I mean, 
I, I I love working in TV, and I love working with my fellow writers and actors and producers and 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 directors, of course, and and you know because it's it's just the whole team coming together. I, I actually that's my favorite part of the entire process when the show is you know in the middle of production and you know you have deadlines and and everyone's working around the clock and. It's just a really exciting, creative time. Definitely. So moving on to my next question and on to your current show, Damien. So Damien is based on the classic horror film series, The Omen. Was a show based on The Omen something you've always wanted to do and were you a fan of the films? Well, uh, that's actually a, a bit interesting the way you're putting that question. Uh, it was not my intention to always do this project. Um, you know, I've always been a horror fan, okay, ever since I was, a, you know, a young teenager. And I've always been a fan of the movie The Omen. And so after The Walking Dead, I signed a deal with Fox where I was developing different shows. I also write a lot of police material. So I was working on different things, and I was trying to stretch, and, and, and I was actually developing a science fiction sort of cyberpunk uh, show, you know, that I was trying to, to develop. And they brought me this opportunity and said, well, you know, we would like to, you know, sort of look at this property in our library and, and try to, you know, develop it for TV. And, it, and The Omen was something they had tried that with before. And so I knew there were certain traps to it. There was a certain, I think, expectation of what that show was going to be. And I felt that's what that last attempt, it was called Omen for The Awakening, just sort of got into a, a final destination rhythm where just anybody who opposed Damien was suddenly killed in a bizarre manner. And it just seemed very obvious. And I, I didn't want Damien to be a, a, a serial killer. You know, I, I really wanted to sort of, you know, see if there was more there, if there was a character way into that iconic character of Damien and, and look at his humanity. And, and so I really started exploring the antichrist model, you know, as a mirror or perverted image of Christ. And so, you know, I was raised Catholic and, and that was, that was uh, sort of uh, uh, themes that I wanted to deal with. And um, so I jumped at the chance and, and they, they let me, you know, run with what I wanted to do. And then we were able to sell it to, a network that then supported that vision and, and I, you know, brought in writers and directors and we just ended up going down that path. So it was exciting, but it was, it was an opportunity that was presented that I felt I was ready for in a sense. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, moving on to my third question, which is a bit of a long winded one, which, so I apologize for that in advance. Creating your own show like you've done with Damien and previously with Crash and taking over someone else's show both present their own challenges. From your experience, what do you think are the main challenges with both scenarios, you know, creating your own show and taking over a show? Uh, that is a tough question. I would say when you take over a show, the final arbiter of where that show lives, of what is the soul of that show, rests with someone else. And so you're sort of like a builder or an architect working for a client, so, and, and you do have a lot of creative free, freedom and you have a lot of suggestions, but ultimately you're trying to satisfy someone else. When you're creating your own show, you know, you do have people collaborating, collaborating with you and you do, you know, work for a studio. Again, it was their property, you know, so I don't have carte blanche, but I, I'm the person on Damien who gets to say, this is the tone of the show. This is the vision of the show. And you, and the organization comes around me to try to help me fulfill that vision. So when you are taken over for someone's show, you're sort of one step removed from the um, um, being the original creative voice. You know, you're try, you know, you're part of someone else's team, whereas when you're the creator, showrunner, it's your team. 
so they're, they're different challenges, you know, and, 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 you know, you know, and, and require different skills, but I would say that's the main difference. I think that's a really great answer. I mean, I think you've definitely shown some of the challenges in both. And so it's a really Thank good you. answer. Thank you for that. Moving on to my fourth question. Have you enjoyed getting to work with Ernest Dickerson, Scott Wilson, and Bear McCreary? Yes, and, and I brought those people into Damien. You know, and I, I would work with them again in the future. I, I You know, Ernest and I... Uh, I think, you know, Ernest directed some, some stellar episodes of Walking Dead, and he was a person that I was familiar with his work, and we tried to work together on Crash. We met at that point, but the schedules didn't allow for that, so I was excited to work with him. Um, uh, you know, he, he, by coincidence, directed um, uh, the first episode of Walking Dead I wrote when before I uh you know, joined the staff for seasons two and three. I wrote a freelance for episode one and Ernest uh, directed that. So we connected over that. And then, and then when um, we were working on walking dead and then I became the showrunner, you know, I gave him some <laughs> really unshootable scripts and he, he just understands me and, and, and really, you know, we have a shorthand and he's just terrific to work with uh, Scott Wilson. I love, he's become a friend and, and, uh, you know, I, I wrote this role specifically for him to get him into the show because I just thought he would, you know, would just be a great part of the family. And with Bear, you know, um, Bear's, you know, busy, uh, like you want to believe. He, he does so many things. He just did the soundtrack for 10 Cloverfield Lane and, and he's doing Outlander and he's busy. So went very early in the process. I um, was leaving the Fox studio one day and I called Bear and said, I think I'm going to do this project and, and I want you to do it. And he jumped at the chance. And, and the wonderful thing about working with Bear is that he comes in, he doesn't read the scripts, I don't think. And he comes in and he sees the, the, you know, the cut, uh, pretty much the, the final cut. And we talk through the process and, so he sees it as an audience and as a fan very late in the process. And then we start talking about how music can support this scene or do we not need music. And, and so when Bear responds to material, it makes me feel like I'm on the right track. So he's sort of my canary in the coal mine, if you will. And he's just, he's just been a wonderful creative partner now on two different shows. Yeah, and Bear does a really great job as always. Like I think... Uh, definitely the music in Damien is really stand out and stellar and he does a really yeah, great he's, job he's again. just wonderful and and you know I, I think he's doing some really exciting stuff and there, there's a scene coming up in our finale in episode 10 uh that is just heartbreaking I think it's one of the best pieces he's ever written so um I, I just I just am very lucky that he was able to uh to work on the show with us well, I look forward to seeing that scene in particular, then mm -hmm. I'm sure I'll know which one it is when I see the finale. So, moving on to my next question. You are described as an advocate and practitioner of diversity in front of the camera, the director's chair, and in the writer's room. What do you think can be done to improve diversity in these well, areas? Well, this is a really... Thank you for asking that. A lot of people don't ask about that. Um, you know, this this is important. You know, there's a lot of people that are not given opportunities to tell their stories. And I kind of feel there's a, 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 a white, uh, male, middle-aged monopoly on a lot of what we see in Hollywood. And, and there are patterns of behavior that exclude a lot of people. And some of them are intentional some of them are unintentional and, and just lazy and and this has been going on for far too long and people are really talking about changing the system and i think you change the system by appealing to people who are in this uh you know who are decision makers who are in hiring positions and you have to really sort of have very long continued uncomfortable conversations about complex matters and you know it's not just that there's one program that's going to come in and, and change everything if if that was possible it would have happened by now 
And so people have to be willing to, you know, continue the conversation and, and to, you know, change and improve, um, you know, practices that include more and more voices. I think it gets done show by show. You know, one of the things I've been talking about lately is that very often, you know, the people are more confident with white men behind the camera as a director. You know, there is an unconscious bias that, that just feels like, oh, that's a leader. That's someone I'm going to trust with a crew and, and millions of dollars. And, you know, if, if, the, you know, if a, a male director is demanding, people say, well, that's an artist. He knows what he wants. And if a female director is demanding, they say, well, she's bitchy and she's hard on the crew. And it's, un- it's unfair. It's not this, it, the playing field is not the same. And everybody should be judged on the quality of their work. So, you know, and, and what I have found by discussing this in different divisions with, within Hollywood, I've spoken to studio presidents and network presidents and executives and the Writers Guild and, and the different talent agencies. Um, you know, Shonda Rhimes were just at a, we were just in a talent agency yesterday speaking to about 40, 50 agents about this. And everybody can pass the buck. They can say, well, I'm not racist or sexist, it's someone else's. And I want to change the system, but I can't do it. And everybody has a comfort zone where they can just kind of fall back to a status quo and not do anything. And we really need to say, okay, uh, you know, who is the best person for the job? Am I looking at the same names over and over? Am I giving everybody the same opportunity? Am I giving somebody a break? Are people being allowed to, you know, are people being washed out of the system because they made one mistake? You know, white guys get to fail up. Okay, my career is a great example of that. So, you know, but other people are not afforded that opportunity. So it's it's really, you know, something that needs to be done, I think, on a daily basis. We need to be mindful of it. And we need to, you know, and, and people need to say that not only is it a problem, but how can I individually be part of the solution? And if that means mentoring someone, recommending someone, sticking your neck out for someone, backing them, supporting them, you know, it's it's hard to make these TV shows. It's hard to make movies. It's it's difficult and, and it creates a lot of anxiety and, and we have to, you know, and so people try to minimize the risk and very often they fall into traditional patterns of behavior and the systems perpetuating themselves. So I think, you know, we all have to, everyone has to take a hard look at themselves and say, where am I in the pipeline and how can I do better? How can I make a difference? Everybody can make a difference. And, and, and you can't wait for your neighbor to make the difference. You have to make the difference. So I don't mean to preach about it, but it's something that I've put a lot of time in talking about with people. And, and I don't have a better solution than that. That's the only solution I have. I think personally it's great that you preach about it because I do think it is such a big situation. And while I do feel some people would think that the – that. Hollywood is becoming slightly more diverse. I do feel that it's not happening quickly enough. Like, as you said, people should be judged on their talents, not, you know, on the obvious things, like you mentioned, whether they're a middle-aged male or whatever. I think, I think you have every right to preach about it. And I think a lot of people would feel the well, same part way. Of, part of the issue is that people feel that if someone is not a straight, white male, that that trait, okay, if someone's a black female or someone's gay or whoever, or someone's in a wheelchair, you know, a lot of times people, you know, skip over actors and writers and directors with disabilities completely. They're sort of the invisible people here. And, but then they're only seen as as that trait. So very often people will say, I don't need a gay writer because I don't have any gay characters or, Oh, I have a character in a wheelchair. So let me get a character. uh, Let me get a writer in a wheelchair to write those stories. The writer in the wheelchair, the disabled writer can write everybody. You know, the, the gay writer can write every character, (laughs) but those non white male writers are seen as specialists instead of 
universal writers. And, and, and that's the difference there. So, so, you know, people say, Oh, well, we just need to get more, you know, if we have more black content, we'll have more opportunities for black writers. Black writers can write every single show that's out there. There's no difference. They're writers. They have imagination. You know, they can write any show that's out there. You know, anybody can. You know, now some people might have certain strengths. You know, somebody might do better on a cop show than a medical show, something like that. But it, it doesn't make a difference with, with, you know, those those individual traits. And, and people just kind of pigeonhole that. And so I don't think it's right. I don't think it's fair. I definitely agree with what you think. So my final question for you, Glenn, is aside from Damien, which is obviously still airing, are you working on anything else coming up that you can talk about? Um, nothing. I, I am actually working on a script. You know, we're between seasons right now. We're waiting to see if we have a season two pickup. So I am I am developing sort of a, a big property. I'm working on a script. I'm not at liberty to announce that, but I am working on something. And then, and then to be honest, I also have some ideas for some short stories I've been working on and, and, and I have uh, an idea for a novel. So I want to, I want to stretch myself as a writer. You know, what was really liberating um, about Damien was it was such a, a, a wonderful, uh, you know, creative process. I think it just kind of <laughs> kicked a lot of, a lot of things loose in my head. So I'm sort of all over the map right now. And, and just writing a little bit of everything. So I can't officially announce anything. Thank you for asking, but it's a pretty productive time for me. So I'm, I'm you know, um, but my top priority is hopefully we'll have a season two of Damien because I, I want to continue that story. I mean, I, I have a, a roadmap for where it goes, and I have a lot. I actually have specific episodes for season two in mind, um, you know, uh, I don't want to tell you who that involves because I don't want you to know who survives the season finale, but it's, um, I, I really do love that show and, and want to continue making it. Well, I'm glad that your time is very productive right now and hopefully indeed that Damien does get picked up for a second season. Thank you very much, Glenn. For well, thank you, Rory. I appreciate questions. it. Thank you. I'll let my co-host Maureen ask hers now. She sure. has a couple for you. Hi, Glenn. How's it going? Good, how are you? I'm not too bad, thanks for asking. Um, just want to say before I get into my questions that I really kind of respect what you were saying about the um, the diversity in front of the camera because that is something that bothered me quite a lot over the years and I'm just glad to see that it's uh, something that is kind of in, like people working in the industry know it as well and are doing something to kind of um, fight it, I suppose, to to improve it, that's the word. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I think people, you know, people want to solve the problem. They just don't know how. And you have to take a risk and, and, and just do it. You just have to do it. And there are talented people out there, you know. Um, they're just not, um, they're just, they just don't have access to, um, um, you know, the showrunners, if they're, you know, staff writers or, or uh, you know, the executives or whatever. Some of these folks are are, you know, a little hard to find because they're not in the main part of the system. But they're out there. There's, there's, a, there's a very, very talented people who are not getting an opportunity, and that needs to change. Yeah, I completely agree. So uh, jumping straight into my first question is that show running is quite a tough job, no matter how big a show is. What would you say is the biggest challenge you've faced as a showrunner over the years? Uh, <laughs> it depends on what the show is, but... Um, I think the, well, you're asking what is the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is really keeping everybody on the same page, not only creatively, but also, uh, emotionally. Very often what happens in Hollywood is because the stakes are so high. Okay. And we're not, it's not, you know, brain surgery. Okay. So I'm not, I don't want to appear to be one of those guys that says, you know, what we're doing is, is more important than what other people do in their jobs. But it does feel like the stakes are high in the sense that there's a lot of money, there's tremendous pressure, there's time and, and things change very, you know, it's very fluid work environment. So people get rattled 
Okay, people have anxiety, people get rattled, and when they get rattled, they stir things up. And when you're a showrunner, all of a sudden you could suddenly have someone thinks you should be doing this, or someone thinks this, or someone doesn't like this, or someone needs to be heard. And then that, that derails the system. And I think what happens is on most shows – you know, the show starts to drift from the showrunner's original creative intent. And then all of a sudden it's about making this, you know, version, this alternate version of the show work. And then people aren't necessarily emotionally invested in that because we were trying to make this and now suddenly we're making that. You see what I'm saying? So it's really hard to, you know, listen to people, collaborate with people, bring people into the system but also then be the final arbiter because not everybody wants to, you know, not everybody accepts a no, you know, not everybody wants to hear that, but the showrunner has to say, I respect you. I hear what you're saying, but this is in line with the show. And sometimes that rattles people. And then, you know, all of a sudden things get in play. So, so that's been a challenge on, on every show I've done. How do you, you know, how do you fight for what you believe in? and yet remain collaborative and open-minded. You know, it's not like on a feature film where you could be an autocrat like a director. It's not like that. You know, you're, you're, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It, it definitely sounds like something that on top of everything else that a showrunner has to do to have that kind of sitting on your shoulders as well must be like, well, I, I I can't actually imagine it, but um. So, my second question is: Has the nature of producing a TV show changed over the years? Now that kind of TV and films almost have the same, like produ- when pr- and producing like they're they're just as big as films are now. That a TV show, something like The Walking Dead, would have these massive budgets, which probably never would have happened years and years ago. I mean, how has that changed the production side of it? Well, I, I think there's less of a model of, of, you know, I think it's sort of anything goes. You know, they, it used to be, you know, cop shows and hospital shows and lawyer shows, and those things still exist. But the marketplace is so complicated that, you know, people saying, okay, what else can we do? You know, you also have a change with special effects. You know, special effects look great, you know, and they're very affordable now compared to what they used to be. So, you know, if you look at, say, the production value of, you know, Game of Thrones or Walking Dead. Now, Game of Thrones has a huge budget, but but people come to expect that look on their TV. But look at a lot of genre shows, you know, and then look at something, you know, from even 20 years ago, you know, The Adventures of Lois and Clark. You you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just it's just, you know, you you couldn't. You know, you people just have a higher expectation. So the, the the filmmaking is more complicated. I think that's why you see shorter orders. You know, I think people are not sure if something's going to stick. I think, you know, um, it just seems like it's very fluid. There used to be more of a rhythm where, you know, when I started, I was on a CBS show called Nash Bridges, you know, and, and the shows would sort of start writing around June and July and August. And then they would come on in September and you'd work until March, you know, have a little break and then get back to work, you know, March or April and then you back to work in June. And there was a rhythm to it. Now it's just, you know, there's stuff shooting all the time. And, you know, Damien was only 10 episodes, but it took, you know, two and a half years to produce because it was, you know, uh, a long um, development process and, and and we had two different writers rooms and 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 uh because you know once we started shooting we will move from one network to another network and additional episodes were picked up so so the whole there's no pattern there's no process there's no system anymore in a sense because everything is always changing and i think i think that confuses executives to be honest because they don't know what the business model for success is so, you know, you could have a certain amount of ratings, but then you also have people streaming online. You have people downloading, you know, there's, there's people have multiple platforms to watch TV. 
So it's it's tricky, you know, and, and I don't think anybody knows what works. So it sort of feels a little bit like the Wild West, you know. Now, that's great for showrunners. If you're an experienced showrunner, people trust that you can get it done. So um, I'm very lucky that I'm in this position and, and I get to, you know, tell the stories I want. But it's it's challenging because it feels like, you know, you're – you're you're sort of uh, trying to ice skate over a volcano. It doesn't make any sense, you know. Yeah, I mean that. It sounds, it sounds like it's just made your. If anything, it's just made your job a bit harder than it originally was. Yeah, and I'm not complaining about it. I love it, you know, and and I love it when you know, even when things are not going well, it's fun, it's exciting, you know. Like I said, I used to work in an emergency room, so I have a high tolerance for crisis. But, you know, it's it's about the people you work with, you know, and then and everybody kind of comes in and you realize you have all these problems. You're supposed to shoot, you know, you're picked up for a number of episodes. You don't have any of those scripts. Everything we do is problem solving and troubleshooting, you know. So it's a matter of just kind of getting it done and, and people get very close. And, you know, I feel very, very close to my writers and, and directors on, on um, and cast, you know, on Damien. And so it it that's rewarding i'd say it's a great feeling to actually when everything comes together just to kind of see it as yeah. go from an idea in your head to on the screens and seeing oh this many people watch it this many people are streaming it um it, it must be a, a really good feeling yeah it's rewarding you know i'll admit it, it was surprising because you know some critics didn't respond to damien you know they they you know because damien is a a unique type of story. You know, there's no, the pilot or episode one is not a microcosm of what the series is. You know, the show reinvents itself every episode. And that's, that's a very aggressive storytelling. I don't want anyone to be able to look at one episode and have any idea what's coming next. And that's kind of the problem. People say, I don't understand the show. I don't know where it's going, but that's my artistic intent. I, it's a show about the devil. It's a show about evil. It, you're not supposed to be comfortable. You're supposed to be on edge every single episode. So initially, some people did not respond to that, you know, and that was, I was, you know, I'll admit that was, that was painful. You know, that was just, uh, I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, I guess it's not working. But then we've connected with fans and, and fans are writing, you know, or tweeting to me or connecting to me on social media. And they love the show. They're watching it over and over. They're obsessed because they get the different layers. They get what we're doing. And that's, that's really been the salvation. You know, when you have, you know, we had an episode that took place in a veterans hospital. And, and people wrote to me and said, you know, I'm from a military family. I've never seen this kind of story told. Thank you for doing this. You know, and that's, that's really meaningful to me. And so when you have people, you know, saying, wow, I'm thinking about God in a different way, or I'm thinking about suffering, or, or I was emotionally moved, you know, Barbara Hershey does a phenomenal job, and people say, I really feel emotionally connected to that character, or I feel sympathetic for Damien, you know, Damien's suffering. I mean, that's incredibly rewarding. So it's, it's really the connection with the fans that have you know, made the entire experience right now worthwhile. I, I, I cannot express my gratitude enough. Yeah, the, definitely. It's just kind of sounds, like you said, like really rewarding. Anyway, um, that's all the questions I have for you now. Thank you very much for answering them, Glenn. I'm going to um, hand you back over to Rory now. Okay, well, thank you very much. appreciate it. That's all of our questions for you today, Glenn. It's been a pleasure talking to you on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I, I really enjoyed that, so thank you. You're very welcome. Hopefully we can talk to you again at some point. So I'll talk to you again soon then. Bye and thanks again for joining us. Um, So Damien is currently on air. You can tune into it every Monday on A&D. So time to wrap up today's show. Make sure to check out our podcast links. Check out our website, website website.everythinggeekpodcast.com slash EGP. Check out our Facebook page www.facebook.com slash everythinggeekpodcast Check out our YouTube channel www.youtube.com slash user slash everythinggeekcast Check us out on Twitter twitter.com slash everythinggeekp Check us out on Instagram instagram.com slash official everythinggeekpodcast Check out our Mixcloud profile 
www.mixcloud.com slash everythinggeekpodcast. Email us at the below email, everythinggeekpodcast at gmail.com. Check out our companion podcast, Everything Geek Comic Cast, www.facebook.com slash everythinggeekcomiccast. Make sure to check out the host's YouTube channels. Mine is www.youtube.com slash user slash Sephardus Destroyers. Maureen's is www.youtube.com slash user slash Lizzie11. Check out Glenn Matsara on Twitter, twitter.com slash Glenn Matsara. And check out Channel 1 and 38 Wave Broadcast Live from www.channel138.com. So geeks out if you want.